This video is supported by Skillshare. Reality's weird. The more we discover at the largest and smallest scales, the more scientists have been forced to ask the same question. What the f***? Why is the universe so big? And why is it continuing to expand with no discernible force causing this expansion? Why do the very smallest pieces of matter behave in ways that make no sense whatsoever? Why is empty space actually teeming with virtual particles that pop in and out of existence? Where did all this come from in the first place? And what came before it? Reality is a giant mystery. And that's okay. Mystery is what makes everything interesting. We don't have to know all the answers to everything. Maybe it's better if we don't. But perhaps the biggest mystery of all is life itself. Was it just an accident? Or was it the inevitable consequence of billions of years of chemistry in the universe? And if it's the latter, does that make life a fundamental part of the universe? Was it designed this way? And perhaps the greatest mystery about life is what happens at the end of it. Countless religions and philosophies have been explored throughout history to try to explain what this is all about and what happens after you die. Even the most militant atheists have thought about what happens in those final moments. There's a famous argument by French philosopher Blaise Pascal from the 1600s. It's called Pascal's Wager. And in it, he basically argues that there either is a God or there isn't. And by that same token, there is either an afterlife or there isn't. And we can't know this until we die. So you might as well believe in God because the benefits of believing in God far outweigh the downsides. Essentially, we live our lives seeking the answer to an eternal binary mystery that we can only learn by dying. Dying is a surrender to the mystery. But what if there was a third option? It's hardwired into life itself. Every life form comes with only two mandates, to spread their genes to another generation and to not become something else's food. All of evolution and life on this planet is derived from those two mandates. A life form that is able to keep from being eaten or survives its environment lives to pass on its genes to another generation, and the strongest in that generation pass it on and on and on and on. So it's no mystery that one of the primary drivers of the human species is to cheat death, to survive. Our literature is saturated with stories of people trying to extend their lives. Our very first story ever written down, Gilgamesh, was all about a guy seeking immortality. Remember the human motto, if it's worth doing, it's worth overdoing. The entire field of medicine is based off this human need to push off death as long as possible. That's how we came up with the medieval theory of the four humors and eventually the germ theory of medicine, antibiotics, vaccinations, uh, organ transplants, stem cell therapy, and now gene editing. These advancements are not always met with open arms. With every step forward in medicine, there's always some people that say that we're going too far, that we're playing God, that we're going against nature. But we do it anyway. Today we have concerns about gene editing with CRISPR-Cas9. Ten years ago, people were upset about stem cell therapy. Fifty years before that, some people called organ transplants an abomination. And a hundred years ago, vaccines... Well, apparently we're still arguing about that. But one by one, these arguments always fall to the wayside. Do you really think that when we have a cure for cancer, we won't do it? Do you really think that when we have a way to treat aging-related diseases, that we won't do it? Do you really think that if we reach the point where we can live indefinitely, we won't do it? Given the progress of technology and medicine throughout history, I think it's a safe thing to say that we're not going to stop until we get there. And even if we do get there, we may keep going. We may start enhancing our bodies, giving ourselves abilities we never had before. I just don't see a situation where we reach a certain point and go, eh, that's good enough. We will always be striving to cheat death until the day that we do until the day that people can live indefinitely and die at the time of their choosing. This is the path that we're on. I don't think that's a controversial statement. Similarly, our definition of death has changed drastically as medicine has evolved. It used to be once upon a time, if you couldn't feel a pulse or a heartbeat, you were considered dead. And this led to so many people getting buried alive that there was a whole industry around bells that you could ring from your coffin if you woke up having been buried. As medicine progressed, we learned how to restart a heart once it stopped beating, so now a stopped heart doesn't necessarily mean you're dead. And we eventually learned how to keep a body on life support even if the brain is dead, so even that doesn't necessarily mean you're dead. Death used to just be a state that you were in. You either were or you weren't. You were either alive or you were dead. Unless you were Schrodinger's cat. Today we know that death is really more of a process. One that starts when your heart stops, also known as clinical death, and ends when your brain ceases all function, also known as legal death. But it has been argued that there's another type of death. 
One that happens when your brain deteriorates so much that the structure of the brain, the information in the brain, the neuronal connections that form your memories and your personality and who you are, when that deteriorates to the point that no information could be gleaned from that brain anymore. Some people call this info death. Technologists kind of touch themselves at the idea of being able to transfer your consciousness out of your body into, say, a simulated world or a robotic avatar. But you still run into the teleportation problem. I covered this in a previous video, but the problem with teleportation is that you're basically creating a copy of yourself and maybe destroying your original body. The idea of a teleportation device is that it scans every atom in your body and then transmits that information to another place where you're reassembled over there. And when you wake up over there, it would feel like you just leaped from one place to another because the memory that you had of leaving that place would be fully formed and recreated back over here. But the experience from the original place would just be lights out. Your consciousness wouldn't necessarily transfer to this new place. It would just be your body being ripped apart, atom by atom. The transporter room in Star Trek was basically a suicide machine. If you really want to survive death and continue your consciousness forward, you need your brain. And this is where the idea of cryonics comes in. Cryonics is the act of stopping the death process by preserving the body in a state of suspended animation until a future time when medical technology can cure the patient. By the way, the words cryogenics and cryonics are often used interchangeably. Not the same thing. Cryogenics is the study of how matter behaves at extremely cold temperatures. Cryonics is a dead frozen dude in a jar. So you can see why cryogenesis are quick to correct you if you use it the wrong way. The fact is, cryonics is not something that's really supported by the overall medical community. At best, it's considered a weird way to kind of donate your body to science. At worst, it's considered kind of a cult. But let's just go with it for a second. Let's just suppose that this video convinces you to give it a try and you're like, wow, that really handsome YouTuber made some spectacular points. I want to get frosty. First of all, you sound awesome. Secondly, you need to pick a cryonics company. Right now, there are really four main companies that provide cryonic services. There's Alcor in Arizona. They're the largest and most well-known. The Cryonics Institute in Michigan, the American Cryonic Society in California, and Cryorus in Russia. Each of these have their own way of doing things, but just for the sake of making it simple, I'm gonna use Alcor's method. First of all, you have to become a member, and for that, you gotta fill out a little bit of paperwork and pay $300 for an application fee. After that, you have to sign some legal documents saying that you give Alcor permission to take possession of your body after you die. Then you pay for it. Now, if you want to freeze your entire body, that's $200,000. If you just want to freeze your head, which they call neurocryopreservation, that's $80,000. Now, you hear numbers like that, and it just totally reinforces the idea that the only people who do this are kind of kooky rich people, but it's actually a lot more affordable than it sounds because this money gets paid out of a life insurance policy. Life insurance, especially if you're fairly young and in decent shape is really not that expensive. Around 50 bucks, I actually did this recently. I signed up, it was like $45 for me. And it might be the only time when the word life insurance actually makes sense. What if we create an insurance that pays a person's family after they die? Death insurance. Sounds morbid. I don't think anybody would buy it. You can just call it life insurance. So you mean totally mislead people? Yeah, okay. Now once you sign a life insurance policy in Alcor's name, you're officially a member. They send you a bracelet and they send you a necklace that has your member ID on it and instructions for emergencies in case you die. And then the only thing left to do is die. And this is actually really important. How you die makes a huge difference to whether or not you'll see the other side. If you get into a car wreck with a tractor trailer and a steel beam goes through your head, no amount of cryo is gonna fix that. But if you die in a bed in a hospice facility from a terminal illness, chances are pretty good. Some people who have signed up for uh, cryonic preservation have actually said that it's caused them to live a little bit safer. They, they don't take as many risks as they used to because that whole fatalism of, well, I'm gonna die someday anyway, completely goes away. How they die actually really matters. In fact, Alcor has relationships with hospice care facilities near their headquarters in Scottsdale, Arizona, and they recommend that people, if they're in hospice care or in you know, terminal illness states, to move there so that they can start the process as soon as possible after they die. And that process begins by putting the body on ice and cooling down the internal temperature while using CPS, which is like CPR, but instead of resuscitation, it's for support, just to keep the blood moving around. They do this by providing chest compressions from a device called the thumper. 
Then they inject medicines into your body to prevent rotting and blood clots, and then hook you up to a heart-lung machine that removes heat from your body until you get to just above freezing. And this is where the magic happens. They tap some of the major arteries and inject medical-grade cryoprotectant solution, which is a fancy word for antifreeze, and slowly over a matter of hours replace the blood with a cryoprotectant mixture. This mixture is actually used today to help transplant human organs. Once the body is saturated with the cryoprotectant, they slowly cool down the body with fans and liquid nitrogen to a temperature of negative 124 degrees Fahrenheit. This is known as the glass transition temperature. <laughs> Wait, did I forget to mention that? Yeah, they basically turn you into glass. Glass is technically known as a non-crystalline amorphous solid, and that's what your body turns into. The antifreeze, the cryoprotectant in your blood, uh, prevents crystals from forming and tearing up the tissues, so the tissues just kind of get locked in place over time. This is known as vitrification. So cryonicists are always quick to point out whenever somebody says that they're being frozen that they're actually being vitrified. Once vitrified, your body will be placed in a large thermos, 10 feet tall and three and a half feet wide with four other bodies, or patients as they like to call them, and you'll be topped off with liquid nitrogen to keep you at a brisk negative 194 degrees. They actually hang you upside down in case somehow the thermos breaks, the bottom would be the last part to thaw so they'll keep the head down there. And here you'll stay, hanging upside down like Dracula. For how long? Nobody knows. The trick, of course, is keeping your body in this state for as long as it takes for medical technology to get to the point where they could revive your body, repair any damage that the freezing process might have caused, and cure whatever disease killed you in the first place. And depending on who you ask, this could be a hundred years from now or a thousand years from now. It could involve nanobots swimming through your body and repairing cells at a cellular level, or it might be, you know, actually going in at the atomic level and rearranging atoms with technologies we can't even figure out right now. Or it could look a lot more like the medicine we use today. But the job of the cryonics company is to bridge that gap between now and the time when all that stuff can be done. They see their job as something as an extension of the emergency services that you were receiving just before you died. Like imagine if you were at a hospital and you were terminal and you were about to die and there wasn't anything the doctors could do to help you there, but across town there was a hospital that had a new piece of equipment that could save your life. The cryonics company is like the ambulance that drives you across town to the other hospital. Only instead of across town, it's across time. Cryonics is kind of like a time ambulance. Now as for what order you would be revived, cryonicists have a strict last in first out policy, which basically means that the last people who are put in there are the first ones to get brought out. The idea being that the further along you go, the better the cryopreservation would be, which increases the opportunity for people to actually be brought back out. This means that the first person who was cryopreserved, James Bedford, a psychologist in 1967, will be the very last person revived. The challenges involved in reviving a vitrified body are countless. Cryonicists are not under any illusion that this is anything but a bet on technology that doesn't currently exist. But cryonics has had some victories in the past few years. Recently a rabbit kidney was preserved in this same way and then was thawed out and re-transplanted back into the rabbit and it continued to work just fine. Human tissue is often preserved this way and then used later for research purposes. Now, no human organ has been vitrified and then re-transplanted back into a body like that rabbit kidney, but uh, organs that are put in cold storage for transportation across the United States are often put through a similar process. Also keep in mind human embryos are stored this way before in vitro fertilization. Right now, there are tens of thousands of people walking around out there who once upon a time were frozen solid. So let's just say you beat the odds. You signed up, you died the right way, the cryopreservation process went well, you lasted the hundreds of years until they were able to repair everything and get you revived. What would that be like? Obviously there's no way that we can know because nobody's done it, but the speculation is that it would just kind of feel like a quick nap. This of course is assuming that there's no spiritual afterlife where you float away and play with all the dogs you used to have when you were growing up. Unlike regular sleep, where your brain is still active and subject to the natural circadian rhythms of your body, in cryosleep, your brain would have no awareness of the passage of time at all. And this would be super confusing because your short-term memory might not actually be there. You might not actually remember dying. All you know is you're waking up in a place you've never been before, surrounded by people you've never met, using devices you've never seen, possibly speaking a language you've never heard. Everyone you know has been long dead. In fact, it could be argued this still is a kind of death because everything you know is gone. From this point, everything could be awesome or it could be a nightmare. You could be wealthy beyond your wildest dreams because of investments that you made hundreds of years ago, or the entire economy may have changed and all of your finances have completely fallen apart. It might be the future utopia of your dreams. Jetpacks, flying cars, interstellar travel. Or it could be a dystopian nightmare on a barely habitable planet. 
Most cryonicists think that a world that would bring them back to life would be more like the former, though I think it's probably somewhere in the middle. Your second chance at life might be amazing, and it might be just as pedantic as the one you're in right now. Jobs, bills, responsibilities. Except you're starting over from scratch, with no support structure whatsoever, and absolutely no marketable skills to speak of. You might be the focus of media attention, everybody wanting to know all about the world that you grew up in. You might be something of a lab rat being experimented on for the rest of your second life. You might be quarantined because you might have some viruses that have long since been wiped out, or there may be some super bugs that you have no immunity to. You could be a celebrity, you could be a pariah, you could be both, but you would be alive. Even if it's a small chance, that's a chance that cryonicists are willing to take. So. Is it really that crazy? If a terminal cancer patient that's exhausted all of their options gets presented with a new option that only has a 5% chance of success, I don't think anybody would blame that person for going for it, even if it costs a ridiculous amount of money. You know, if it works, fantastic. If not, well, you're gonna die anyway. Dying is an act of faith. It's a surrender to the mystery. No matter what you believe in regarding the afterlife, even if you believe nothing happens at all, you're still betting that you're right. Cryonicists have placed their bet on humanity. Pascal had his wager. This is the cryonicist wager. Is it one you'd be willing to take? Let's talk about it in the comments. I think the worst thing about waking up 500 years from now is seriously, what could you do if you had to get a job? Like what kind of skills would you have that would possibly translate to a world 500 years more technologically advanced than today? Hell, just keeping up with the advancement in real time today is a challenge. Luckily, there's Skillshare. Skillshare is an online learning community with over 20,000 classes in programming, business, technology, you name it. If you want to learn it, if it could help you in your business and your career, it's there. Premium membership gives you unlimited access to high quality classes that will keep you ahead in skills and topics that you want to know all about, that'll give you opportunities in your life and career and let you do what you love. Perhaps consider the course Demystifying Artificial Intelligence, Understand Machine Learning by Christian Hellman, who's a senior designer at Microsoft. Find out how computers may someday make it possible to extend our lives forever, among other things. Millions of people are learning new skills on Skillshare every single day, so you might want to get caught up. Skillshare is offering a special offer to the people, the viewers of this channel. You can get two free months of Skillshare if you sign up at the link down below. That's 20,000 classes. That should keep you pretty busy for the next couple of months. Big thanks to Skillshare for supporting this video and an extra special thanks to the answer files on Patreon who are doing so much. I, I put a, a little video out saying I was worried about some things and they made me feel so much better. Such a great community over there. I can't thank you guys enough. I have some new people who have joined. I want to give them a quick shout out and destroy their names real quick. We've got Brian Thorndike, Joel Hageman, Thomas Lockhart Mitchell, Ola Bilstein, Ron Lanning, Javier Baracal Sakeo, Dan Miller, Russell Fortier, uh, Timothy Sessler, Anthony T. Burke, Mac upped his pledge. Thank you for that, sir. Robert Seals, Mike Morgan, uh, Michael Gontko, um, Alan Johns, Jeremy Harris, Bart Newman, Mark Clancy, Eric Ainberg, and Bobo. Thank you guys so much. If you'd like to join them and be a part of an awesome community and get extra perks that other people don't get, you can go to patreon.com slash answers with Joe. Please like and share this video if you liked it and if this is your first time here, uh, maybe check out some of my other stuff. And if you like those as well and the topics that I talk about, hit subscribe. I come back with videos just like this every Monday. Cool t-shirts available at the store, answerswithjoe.com slash shirts. Thanks again for watching. You guys go out now and have an eye-opening week, and I'll see you next Monday. Love you guys. Take care.